Blessed is our God at all times, both now and ever, and unto ages of ages. Amen. Heavenly King, Consoler, Spirit of Truth, present in all places and filling all things, the treasury of blessings and the giver of life, come and dwell within us. Cleanse us of all stain and save our souls, O good one. Welcome back to our Byzantine uh, lectionary reflection. Uh, we have a bit of a challenge this Sunday, Father Sebastian, in that the uh, Slavic lectionary and the Greek lectionary depart in the sense that they have two different Gospels. Uh, in, the, in the Slavic tradition, the, the Gospel is applied uh, for this, uh, this, this Sunday following Pentecost and, um, and the Greek tradition uh, for the Feast of the Nativity of John the Baptist. So we're going to jump right in and take the Slavic lectionary Gospel, just say a few words about that, and then move on to the Greek tradition. Um, uh, so let's take a look at Matthew chapter 8, Matthew chapter 8, verse 28, Matthew chapter 8, verse 28. You can open your Bibles there. Make sure you get out a Bible when we're doing these Bible studies in preparation for the coming Sunday. Matthew chapter 8, verse 28 in the Slavic usage. Um, and, and when he came to the other side, to the country of the gatherings, Two demoniacs met him, and coming out of the tombs so fierce that no one could pass that way. And behold, they cried out, What have you to do with us, O Son of God? Have you come here to torment us before the time? Now a herd of many swine were feeding at some distance from them, and the demons begged him, If you cast us out, send us away into the herd of swine. And he said to them, Go. So they came out and went into the swine, and behold, the whole herd rushed down the steep bank into the sea and perished in the waters. The herdsmen fled, and going into the city, they told everything and what had happened to the demoniacs. And behold, all the city came out to meet Jesus, and when they saw him, they begged him to leave their neighborhood. And getting into a boat, he crossed over and came to his own city." Father, we want to get a, a bit of a context here because I know, uh, looking back in my own past, I was very uh, confused about who these um, the the these uh, the Gerasenes were and uh, what is their background and uh, how do they relate to the people of God, uh, the the Jews on the other side of the Sea of Galilee. The first thing I we're going to have a little bit of a say a travel log for our participants today. We're going to pull up some maps and show exactly where Jesus went. Um, and so I just I encourage you to look back uh, to that first verse of your text in chapter 8, verse 28, and you'll notice that it says, uh, and when he came to the other side. Um, as you're reading through your gospel account, uh, whenever Jesus it says that he came to the other side, when we're dealing with up there in Galilee, we're talking about the other side of, of the Jordan River. So you have the Jordan River, which comes in in the, in the basically the center of the Sea of Galilee in the north and exits basically in the center of the Sea of Galilee in the south. And that's kind of a demarcation line. It was a political line, a political line uh, between the sons of Herod the Great. Herod the Great had divided his kingdom into three parts uh, and given it to his three sons. Uh, Archelaus received Judea. Herod Antipas, his son, uh, so Herod the great son Herod, then inherits the western side of the Sea of Galilee, uh, and Philip inherits the, uh, the eastern side of the Sea of Galilee, and that's exactly where Jesus goes. So it says he, he got into the boat, leaving then Capernaum and that area where he loved to live there, and then crossed over to the other side of the sea, crossing that line of the Jordan River, and ends up in this town. So, Father, who are these people that are living over there on the eastern shore, shore of the Sea of Galilee? Well, originally this was part of the tribal allotments in the, when, the, when Joshua came in and the people inherited the different parts of the land. But the, by now, because of the Assyrian conquest of the region, then the Babylonian conquest, then the Greek conquest, and the returns of exiles and diaspora, populations have certainly shifted. So, over on the on the east side is primarily Gentile land. This is the Galilee of the Gentiles, as we'll hear in the Gospels as well. So the, in this area where we're talking about specifically, this area of Gadara or Gergesa or 
Gerasa, you have the different names because of these different towns in the different Gospels. That region is right around five o'clock on the Sea of Galilee. So we're looking at the sea kind of like a, a clock that helps us think of, we're not talking about right where the Jordan drops out at six o'clock, like you said, south, uh, and, uh, but not due east, but right in between, kind of a, a southeast area. And we're pulling up uh, these maps here for you so you can see where we're talking about exactly. Um, you can still visit the place today. Of course, there's a marker there, a big stone that marks this place, um, as there are a number of places around the Sea of Galilee where Jesus' healings took place, and you can go visit those places today. Now, Father, it says that uh, there were two demoniacs here in the Gospel of Matthew, but I think it's in, if, correct me if I'm wrong, in, in, in Mark and, and maybe also in Luke, where there's one, it appears there's one demoniac, and here there's two. So what's, what's, the, what's the, did Jesus go here twice? Did he encounter, you know, I mean, it looks like there's all these, these demoniacs all over the place over here. So uh, this is an interesting difference between Matthew and Mark and Luke. So Matthew, Mark, and Luke all tell us <clears throat> about this trip to this region and dealing with a demoniac. And it's obvious that all three Gospels are talking about the same story. But when we look at Mark and Luke, the stories are very similar in that there's one demoniac there. Matthew tells us there are two. And so ooh, what's the problem? There's, it's, is it one or two, right? There's the, here's the question. So when we look at the story, we find that the, the demons speak in the plural. And so one suggestion has been that, well, maybe the idea of plurality has, has moved over in the scribal copying of the book to actually being more than one demoniac. That could, could be possible based upon how scribes do these things in the copies in the early, early period. But it's a part of a larger pattern Matthew's gospel, which indicates there's something else going on. In Matthew's gospel, we hear about two demoniacs. In Matthew's gospel, when Mark and Luke, there's one. In Matthew's gospel, there are two blind men on the road to Jerusalem out of Jericho. In Mark and Luke, there's only one. I could go on. There's a number of examples where you get these duplets in Matthew's gospel where Mark and Luke only have one. It probably goes back to a, something linguistic. Matthew's gospel is unique among the four gospels in that it was originally written in Aramaic. And Semitic languages, particularly Hebrew and Aramaic, use the plurals in different ways than we do, not always meaning more than one. So there's something in that, like that probably going on, but someone's going to have to write a few dissertations to get to the bottom of it. It's, it's fascinating. You know, Jesus comes over here and heals these demoniacs as he goes about his healing ministry uh, in the Sea of Galilee. And, um, and you know, there was a, an elderly priest that said one time uh, to me, he says, he's life apart from God, life apart from the church is a very lonely life. And here we, we encounter these men um, and they're, they're, they're uh, living in the tombs. They're living apart from society. And Jesus has come in his ministry to reclaim dominion over them. It's a big a false notion, a, 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 a really a twisting of the truth, a lie of the devil, that apart from God, we will find freedom. But in fact, apart from God, we don't find freedom. We find, uh, we find simply dominion uh, under another power, and that is the slavery to the evil one. Either we are going to find dependence, you know, we are made, we are made for relationships, and therefore we are made for dependence upon one another and ultimately dependence upon God. Um, uh, and and uh, there's, there's all sorts of false notions of, uh, and temptations to independence in our society and freedom in our society, but the fact of the matter is we remain very dependent people in a good way or in, in a very bad way apart from God. Um, and so he comes there to encounter this world which has come under the power of the evil one, very much symbolic of the fallen world. Uh, and, and very beautifully, he gets in, in this text, he gets into the boat, which is always the Father's goodness. The boat is a symbol of the church. Uh, and there the stormy waves of this world crash upon it. It's only within the safety of the church, uh, the community of God, that, uh, that, that the apostles are going to find uh, authentic freedom and authentic peace under the dominion, not of the evil one, but under the dominion of God himself. Um, very interesting that you, you would think that the reaction of these people in the story would have been otherwise. I mean, 
these are two men that are probably from this town. And here they're, they're demoniacs. They're under the power of the evil one, disrupting all sorts of, of probably within, within the town and, and known very well for their, their, uh, the, the situation in which they're living. And yet he goes and he, he casts them into swine, the, the demons into swine. Um, and first of all, why are they, these guys herding swine and so forth if they're living in the region where the Jews are living? So yeah, this is, uh, as we talked about before, and you were talking about the divisions there, this region was, was largely Gentile here. Right. If there were Jews there, they were living as fully Hellenized Jews. They were living as, as Gentiles. And so the, the swine herds in this region are being, uh, are, are being herded by the, the men of the villages and the towns in that area, which probably is behind that name variation. If we look at Mark and Matthew and Luke, we look at these different, we, and even in the manuscripts of each of the Gospels, we find that the name changes of where they are. Is it Gadara or is it Gergesa or Geras, uh, Gerasa? The, these, little, these are towns in that region, some farther away than others. And what happened is maybe you might have some swine herders from these different towns, and that gives us the different names. Or it might just simply be referring to a town that one, per, one scribe knew better than another scribe. Either way, it's the same area. This is an area that is under the control of the Gentile world. It is not part of the, of the, um, uh, part of the Jewish culture anymore, at least, and not, certainly they're not part of their religion. Well, and, uh, maybe a final question here before we move on to our Greek lectionary. Why would these guys want him to leave? You would think they would have embraced this uh, wonder-working man that healed probably their couple of sons or brothers of these guys, right? The men of the town. Well, this the problem is this is their economy. Jesus just crashed their economy, right? This is their whole, those little villages were dependent upon these herds of swine. And this is, this is how they're making their money. They're selling these swine. Uh, and all of a sudden, everything they had is suddenly gone, floating dead in the sea. And uh, obviously, as, as you mentioned earlier, there's this theme of the, the demonic world. And the fathers talk about this, right? Jesus has wiped out the, the demons. And the physical sign of that is the swine, the unclean animals are now gone as well. So Jesus cleansed the region of its iniquity. Uh, and, and then they have this funny response. And it's, the problem is, is Jesus just messed up their economy. Jesus just messed up their livelihood at least from their perspective, you know, and that creates a problem for them. They have to make a decision. Sure. And, you know, over the last couple of weeks, you've been really focusing our attention on the, uh, uh, how the apostles are called to reprioritize their life, to bring their whole life to the ministry of Christ, not to abandon their life, but reprioritize it. Uh, you know, uh, the, the, the fishermen are to bring their boats. Peter opens his home uh, to Jesus' ministry and so forth. Uh, and here, I think we can really apply this now to our life to ask a, a, an important question. You know, would, would we prefer Jesus to go away had we been standing there that day? Um, or maybe more uh, to the point, would we prefer Jesus to go away right now in our life and stop bothering us uh, in the sense that, um, you know, the faith is a, is a demanding faith. And there are times, you know, when our, when our, when our faith uh, and the practicing of our faith kind of gets in the way, gets in the way of our work. Uh, as we approach summertime, it gets in the way of our weekends a lot of times, our family, our friends, our vacation. Um, and, uh, and, I, and I find and I see, sadly, oftentimes people making a choice away from the faith, away from Jesus, in order to live their life. And when we live a life apart from God, as I said before, we do not find freedom, but simply slavery to another power. And certainly we see that in this, in this town. They've become enslaved by their economy, if you will. And rather than rejoice in the freedom of their brothers who have been healed, uh, they drive Jesus, the one who can give them life, away from uh, their life. And we're challenged. And we can, we can maybe just leave it at this. There's, there's much to think about. 
Um, but uh, with those questions, when we go on vacation, is the first thing we do when we make our plans to find where are we going to go to church? I was saying this to my parishioners the other day. Um, that we cannot take a vacation from being Christians. And if we're planning to go to a town where there is not a church that we can attend, then what are we doing going on vacation there? Um, if our work is, is such that it's getting in the way of going to church, are we making the proper changes in our life to make it possible to make our relationship with God and with the church the first order of business and everything else in relationship to that? So we have this challenge here in the gospel today, but uh, with that, let's move on to our Greek lectionary, um, and, uh, which focuses our attention on the nativity of St. John the Baptist. Um, and uh, yeah, I love this feast day because it's, it's one of three nativity feasts that we celebrate in the church. Um, and uh, of course, the nativity of Christ our God, uh, the nativity of the Theotokos, and the nativity here of John the Baptist. Every other feast day um, uh, tends to focus upon the, the, uh, the person's death, the day of their death. Um, but here in these three, these three people, it's not. It's their nativity. And we're going to talk about that in, in, in a moment um, and uh, jump right in here to the gospel account, Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. And Father, and for our participants, we're not going to read through the whole of the text. It's quite a long gospel that's applied for this Sunday. But I'm going to encourage you to get out your Bibles you can, you can hit pause, uh, get out your Bibles, read Luke chapter 1 in its entirety. Luke chapter 1 in, in its entirety. Um, and then after you've done that, you can go back and hit play here, and we're going to jump through the text um, very quickly. Uh, the, the text begins right here at the beginning of, uh, of Luke. So, Father, remind us. Um, in fact, let me read just the first few verses, and then I'll ask my question. Since many writers have undertaken to draw up a narrative concerning the things that have been fulfilled among us, even as they who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have handed them down to us, I also have determined, after following up all things carefully from the very first, to write for you, most excellent Theophilus, an orderly account that you may understand the certainty of the words in which you have been instructed. So, Father, it appears as though Luke is a secondhand witness here. He's, he's collecting things. So, it, it, he's not an apostle? So, Luke is an apostolic figure. You could call him an apostle, one who is sent. Uh, but he's not one of the twelve. That is usually where we get that, get that title because Jesus sent out the twelve. But Luke is an apostolic figure like Mark. He's around in that among the apostles, but he was not one of the 12 disciples. There is an early Christian tradition that Luke was part of the 70. Uh, so he may have had some contact with Jesus earlier on. But we, we know with certainty that Luke appears on the scene uh, at, at least by the time that Paul begins his journeys. And this is where we, he, we see him, uh, his name appearing in the epistles that Paul's writing. He's along with him in various places. He wrote two books, the Gospel of Luke, the Gospel according to Luke, and then also the sequel, Acts of the Apostles. And, and then, of course, if the, that's the author. Who's the audience? What's the purpose of yeah, writing? Who's, the, who's he, Theophilus? He yeah, mentioned Theophilus. Theophilus. Uh, we hear that name today. Sometimes you'll hear a bishop named Theophilus or some monk named Theophilus, but that's because of this. Theophilus is a Greek word, means friend of God. And while it could theoretically be an individual, which it sounds like the way it's been translated in English, we have translation, and then all of a sudden we have transliteration, Theophilus, and then it goes back to translation. And so it sounds like this is someone's name because in English, names don't usually mean anything to us. And here, if we don't know Greek, this just is another one of those kind of funny names. But if we translate the name into English, like we translate the rest of the sentence, friend of God, then it becomes a little more clear, as m most commentators agree, that this is a, re a, a term of endearment for his audience. So that you may know, O oh, excellent friend of God, the certainty of the things in which you've heard. And then that brings us to that third question of who's the author, who's the audience, what's the purpose of writing? The purpose of writing is to 
to confirm, to clarify, to remind the, uh, the audience, his readership, of what Jesus did, said and did. And that's the same reason why we read the gospel in the church today. From the, from the time Luke wrote this and before when it was being preached orally in the churches, all the way into today, it's to confirm, to clarify for an audience that is already Christian the faith that they know. Many people think of the Gospels or the Bible, something that kind of dropped out of the sky and is used to you know, go door to door or put in a drawer of a, of a hotel to hope people are going to have a conversion experience. And while the Holy Spirit can work in those ways, that's not the original intent of these books. These books, the New Testament books, the epistles, all the books of the Bible were intended for an audience and for a Christian gathering that is there to celebrate the faith that they have gathered together and to hear in the midst of that, that gathering, that meeting, the, hear the, the gospel story. Interesting. Interesting. Father, let's pick up the text in verse, in verse five, it says in the days of Herod, King of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah of the division of Abijah. And he had a wife, of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. What is this? Uh, what, first of all, we got to make sure we understand we're talking about the, an Old Testament priest, right? We're in the New Testament, but, but nevertheless, um, so we're talking about in the, uh, in, in the Jewish tradition. So give us a sense of what this, this meant to be a priest within that tradition, and what is this, d- the divisions of the priesthood, um, and he's going to go up there and He's going to have an opportunity to sacrifice. It's a, a, a special opportunity for him. But share with us a little bit about what this looked like. Okay, so the, the priesthood that Zechariah has is inherited priesthood. It's hereditary. And it comes from Aaron, his great ancestor. We remember that about uh, 1,500 years before this story, Moses had brought the Israelites out of Egypt. To Mount Sinai. When they were there, they were given direction of how to build the tabernacle, the place where God would dwell among them. And they were also given direction that Aaron would be the one who would minister and care for that tabernacle and offer the sacrifices and make sure the lamps were lit and all of that. And his sons would assist him. And then from then on, the descendants from Aaron all the way down until we get to this point, like Zechariah, they continue in that job. So that's the, the role of the priest in, in this Old Testament period. This is, a, a, this is the Aaronite priesthood, which is also called the Levitical priesthood because the family of Aaron was part of the greater tribe of Levi. And then the, the division of Abijah, the, uh, by the time we get to David, 500 years from Moses and Aaron, there's a problem. There are so many descendants of Aaron. You can imagine 500 years after Aaron that there's a little bit of chaos of who's going to serve and when. And and so David divides up the priesthood, the family of Aaron, into 24 divisions. And each division, each family, like Abijah, the family or division of Abijah, comes and serves at the temple two weeks out of the year. And for those two weeks, they do all the duties. They trim the lamps, they offer the sacrifices and things like that. Then they go home. And then another family comes in, and this allows there to be a little bit more of an organization in, uh, in the system. We picked that up there in verse 8. Now, while he was serving as a priest before God, when his division was on duty, so those are those couple of, that, a couple of weeks, that opportunity he has. Now, mm-hmm. he's chosen to offer incense uh, during, this, uh, during this time. And I think this is going to be very interesting to our participants. There's a little, a little fact given uh, as they're tra- trying to describe who this guy is and who his wife is, a little fact guy says, but, and I always, whenever we're reading the Bible, we hear, but we should just stop reading, stop, hold on. But the author has something very important to tell us. They had no children. So he goes up to the temple and to offer the incense. Um, and suddenly an angel appears to him and says, your petition has been heard. Your petition has been heard. So, Father, explain to us what's going on here. You're talking about this division of the priesthood. Uh, they have this opportunity to go up and pray. 
Um, it sounds like this petition that he has is, a, is a quite an important one. It is, it is come to the throne of God himself. It's being answered right now. What, what is the petition that he's asking for? What, what's his request? Well, as we hear, he says, your, your, do, your, your wife is going to have a son, right? So you're going to have a child. So that's obviously the, the petition. But it, it is, like you said, if you read this carefully, it, it's a little surprising. All of a sudden, your petition, what petition? We hadn't heard about this before. But if we're reading this carefully and we know the Old Testament background, it's pretty obvious what's going on. He's going at the hour of incense. Now, we know in our Byzantine tradition, the hour of incense and the connection of prayer, because we sing at Vespers every Saturday evening, Psalm 140, or 141, depending on your counting. Let my prayer arise like incense, and the lift up my hands like an evening sacrifice. This, this idea of the prayer arising with the incense, the incense being the physical image of the prayer arising to God, we hear that in the psalmist, but it, it also, we hear this in this, this service that we're looking at here, this morning service, goes all the way back to Exodus chapters 29 and 30. It's called the Tamid offering, which Tamid continuous in Hebrew, because every day they did this. Every morning at sunrise, they would offer a lamb on the altar of burnt offering outside the, the, the temple. And inside the temple or sanctuary, Moses' tent, same thing, they offered incense on the altar of incense. They did this every morning and every evening. They offered a sacrifice and the prayer, the incense arose showing that God has accepted their prayer and, and will, of course, hopefully bless them for uh, what they need. And so this is, he is standing at the altar of incense. This is something that probably uh, by, it says it came to him by lot. According to some scholars, based upon the statistics of the numbers of priests in the division of Abijah and all the divisions at this point, that by casting lots and what duty would come to which person, and this was the highest duty, the offering of incense, this would probably only come to a priest once in a lifetime, maybe twice max. So even if the calculations are slightly off, this is a very rare, very rare occurrence for Zechariah. Maybe the only time he's got to do this. And it's a very sacred moment. He's going into the holy place and he's going to stand right in front of the altar of incense, which blocks the way to the Holy of Holies, where the Ark of the Covenant was supposed to be. Uh, it had been lost, of course, during the exile. So there, he's going to stand right there in the spot where incense was to be offered as a sign of his prayer arising. Of course, we know what prayer he's asking, right? He, is a, he has inherited a, a, the priesthood from his father's father's father. It goes all the, all the way back to Aaron, but he has no son, and he can't pass that on. And in that culture, that's, a, that's like, it's an extreme embarrassment, but almost like a curse from God, seen as, as without, he is without blessing. Um, but we know he's righteous, and what an intense prayer that must have been in that moment. And, you know, suddenly the gospel account um, turns for us here as the, as, as the angel Gabriel appears, um, and uh, in verse uh, 12, 13, and following, and, and then suddenly... The whole of the gospel account surrounds this question of his name. They're going to name him John. Zechariah goes mute. They're having to do uh, hand signals and so forth like that. Everybody's surprised. Um, and I, I know that, that you've talked before about this importance of names. Um, and now there's a bunch of characters here. We've got Zechariah. We've got Elizabeth. We've got Gabriel. And now we've got John. Um, is Luke trying to focus our attention upon the names and the meanings of these names behind be, uh, that maybe our uh, people today are not uh, getting the meaning of? Yeah, so for us, names don't mean anything, right? We, if, if we think about in, in American culture, now, you know, in, in speaking in Arabic, maybe in, uh, in Lebanon or Jordan or Palestine, a, a name means something there. But and in Greece, a name might mean something. But here in our American English context, names being borrowed from other cultures and other languages in English typically don't have any meaning, aside from an occasional joy or faith or charity or something like that. And so we tend to just gloss over these in the New Testament as we're reading or the Old Testament. But 
often the name has something to do with the story. And here's a great example. You can see, as you mentioned, how he's focusing on this theme of the name John, especially at the end of the story. So we can look back and we look at the name Zechariah and Elizabeth, and you can see they're all pointing to the same thing. Zechariah, Yahweh remembers. What does God remember? If you go back to the Old Testament, whenever we hear about God remembering, and the other story of the flood, for example, it's God remembering his covenant. That is, he's maintaining, he's keeping his covenant. When, uh, when we look at the next name that comes up, Elizabeth, Elishava, God of oath. Again, God, when does God take an oath? When, is the, he's, when he makes a covenant. For 500 years, these people have been waiting for the covenant to be restored. For 500 years, they, they've had no glory cloud in the temple. The Messiah hasn't been there. They've been under the dominion of foreign powers they're waiting for the kingdom to be established, for the glory cloud to appear in the temple, for the Messiah to appear, and for them to have what they believe to be uh, a restoration of the, the kingdom like the kingdom of Solomon times infinity. But it hasn't happened. It hasn't happened. The prophets all said this was going to happen. It hasn't happened. And so, and so they're waiting, and they're waiting, and they're waiting for this covenant to be fulfilled. And finally now we hear the covenant is going to be fulfilled. God does keep his promises, and that's where we get the name Johanna or John. Johanna is a Hebrew name. Yahweh is gracious. He gives. Mm -hmm. And we go back to the Old Testament context. What, what does God give? We see an example of this in the prologue of John. The gift of God in the Old Testament is the law given by Moses at Mount Sinai, the covenant and the law that comes with it. That's the word of God, which and through the word of God, by obedience to the word of God, they were brought into communion with their heavenly father. But we know the rest of the story of the Old Testament. But so now God is going to be sending them a restoration of that covenant, a new covenant, in fact. And how is it going to happen? By his word coming and dwelling among us, as John tells us. Jesus is the gift of God that will be given, the grace of God, the new law, the new covenant. And, of course, we uh, will see that in the episode later in this chapter. You know, and, and it makes me think how, how beautiful it is that, that though the word of God written on stone in the Old Testament is now going to become enfleshed in Jesus Christ, but not only for him, but he is going to breathe his, his, the gift of his life into us again. And, uh, and I, just looking at the text here, you know, it, it, it says that, that he will drink no strong drink and it shall be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. So the restoration of this covenant, uh, John is going to be a bit of, like in some sense the incarnation of this restoration, the beginning of what we're going to see in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, which is the reason why, going back to the Feast of the Nativity, the reason why uh, John's nativity is celebrated in the church because the, the, the fathers tell us that uh, at the time of the visitation of the mother of God to Eliz her cousin Elizabeth, we know that the babe in Elizabeth's womb, which, who is John the Baptist, leapt for joy. And the saints tell us that in this moment he confessed Christ, professed his faith in him, and was in, in some sense baptized in the womb of Elizabeth and therefore born in communion with God. And so just as the mother of God, uh, uh, Jesus himself, so now John the Baptist has also celebrated his day of his birth, for he is, he is born in communion, filled with the grace of God. You know, Father, the text goes on to say that, that John will, be, will come in the power, the spirit and the power of Elijah. The spirit and power of Elijah. Um, I know we can go back and 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 uh, and maybe our uh, participants wanted would like to do this with us to go back to the prophet Malachi, the prophet Malachi, uh, the last of the great prophets of the Old Testament, probably is put in your Bible right before the book of uh, First Maccabees. It's in the last chapter of Malachi that uh, in the fa last few verses that it says that that before the coming of the Messiah, before the great and terrible day of the Lord, um, before the coming of the Son of Righteousness, behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes, and he will turn the hearts of their fathers to their children, the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the land with a curse. 
so we have here the fulfillment, this expectation of the people that, that Malachi's prophecy would be fulfilled. And sure enough, the, what they're waiting for comes about here in the life of John the Baptist, who is, uh, in a sense, Eli the Elijah returned. We remember he's down in the Jordan River. He's dressed up in the same outfit, if you will. Uh, he's playing uh, prophet dress up, if you will, dressed up like Elijah. Um, but there's something more here. I want to ask you a question. Why Elijah? Why is it that John the Baptist is going to come in the spirit and power of Elijah rather than, say, the spirit and power of Moses or the spirit and power of Melchizedek or, the, or whatever? You mentioned something about this 500 years, um, and I'd like you to kind of flesh that out a little bit. What happened 500 years ago that there was a problem, and how does that relate to here this day when the Gabriel appears to the priest Zechariah? So, yeah, so 500 years earlier, again, give or take a few decades, these are round numbers I'm giving us. So the, the, in 587, the, the temple was destroyed. And then about 70, 80 years later, while these people have been in exile in Babylon this whole time, Daniel, the prophet, is there in Babylon, and he looks at the prophet Jeremiah's writings and he realizes it's supposed to only be about 70 years in exile. And so, and he knows, Hey, we've been here for 70 years. So he begins to pray at the hour of incense. This is the evening hour of incense. He begins to pray and the angel Gabriel appears at the hour of incense and tells Daniel that his prayer, his petition has arisen to God, that the exile will now be over, that they will return to their land and rebuild things. But that's the good news. There's also some bad news. And the bad news is that while they are going to return after 70 years, the, the exile will not be complete and the restoration will not come in its fullness for 70 weeks of years. So, that gives us 490 years, 490 years. And then and only then will everything come. The Messiah will appear, the king will be established and all of that. That's when Gabriel first appeared to, in the Bible to tell Daniel about these things. It would happen 500 years later. And here now, Gabriel appears again to Zechariah here, the hour of incense, and tells him that the fulfillment has now come. Wow. This is, uh, you know, you got to go back and read this, these, these texts in the Old Testament really to help you understand, to get the vision of what's taking place. I'll give you a few passages that might be helpful. Uh, Exodus chapter 40, the filling up of the temple or the tent of God with the, the glory cloud of God, which you had mentioned had, had departed uh, at the time of the Babylonian exile when apparently everything was lost. Our, our participants can go back and I think, Correct me if I'm wrong, Father, but it's Ezekiel chapter 11 that they'd want to look at, uh, the glory cloud of God. And, uh, and then, as you're saying, you know, Zechariah goes and stands before the holy place to offer incense before the holy of holies. But sadly, in his day, it was empty. Huh? The Ark of the Covenant had been lost during the, during the time of Jeremiah, during the Babylonian exile. Or Babylon, the attack of the Babylonians, um, and the glory cloud, the, the, the revelation of God's presence among his people um, had departed there in Ezekiel, uh, mounting upon the Mount of Olives and eventually ascending into heaven. And, uh, and so the, really in the time when John the Baptist comes, the time of Christ, uh, the temple isn't what it was in the sense that there's, there's no physical evidence that it is God's house anymore. And this really is what the people, it says the whole multitude of people were gathered there, which is, uh, you were mentioning Orthros and Vespers, and I thought, man, wouldn't it be great if our people believed like, like, uh, like these people, they come and the, the multitude are coming for Orthros and Vespers. Um, and uh, if only we had the faith of the, uh, of the Old Testament church as they're standing there at the temple praying for God to act in their life to bring about their restoration and their freedom from these foreign powers. Um, you know, let's, let's just uh, go right to the end of the gospel here that we're, that we're looking at. Um, and it, it says that, uh, that 
Zechariah, his father, was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has visited and wrought redemption for his people. And this is, of course, Zechariah's beautiful hymn that he sings. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has visited and wrought redemption for his people. And you, child, shall be called the prophet of the Most High. For you shall go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways. And the child grew and became strong in spirit and was in the wilderness until the day of his manifestation to Israel. You know, we hear, of course, the reference back to the prophet uh, Malachi. Uh, Maybe you can point that out to us again and and clarify for our readers. We're going to be going back to this text. Um, um, But can you talk also about this idea of wilderness? You know, you and I have been there to this place where uh, tradition tells us that John the Baptist was living out there in the Judean desert. Um, And uh, it's the same place as they've discovered the Dead Sea Scrolls. You go visit there today. It's an amazing, uh, almost otherworldly feeling there. Um, Can you speak a little bit about this wilderness? Why does he go out to the wilderness? Uh, And is there a connection here with the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls to help us understand? But also back to uh, connection back to the prophet Malachi. Well, uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls, it's, it is interesting. We, we need a, another, uh, I think, another reflection to talk about all the details there. But the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered a bit south from this area, this approximate same desert region. And there is certainly a lot of parallels between what we find in the Dead Sea Scrolls, the theology there, and the theology and the preaching of John the Baptist, uh, the theme of repentance, and that the... the um, God is going to come and judge the, the world and, and the fire and all of that. A lot of similar themes. Some have suggested that maybe while John was out there, there may have been some contact between him and whoever, whatever group was the author of those Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, the, uh, the reference to Malachi again, John the Baptist is going to be the one who's going to go before the, the Most High to prepare the way. This reminds us of Malachi chapter 3. The people were, were in a crisis of faith. They had come back from exile. They had rebuilt the temple. They rebuilt the city of Jerusalem. And the glory cloud didn't appear. But the prophet said it was supposed to happen. It didn't happen. And so God sent them the prophet Malachi to let them know that, that God is on his way. The glory cloud will come to the temple. This is Malachi chapter 3. But he will send a messenger to prepare them beforehand. And that messenger, as we hear at the end of the book, as you mentioned, is Elijah the prophet. And so that's, of course, what happens. John the Baptist comes in the spirit of Elijah to prepare for the glory cloud to return to the people. And we all know John the Baptist prepares for Jesus. Jesus is that glory cloud returning, God's presence returning to his people. Uh, and then, of course, the, the last reference, as you mentioned, to the wilderness there in verse 80. He was out in the wilderness. That recalls... Uh, some funny words there we heard earlier in Gabriel's uh, speech to Zechariah. He will drink no wine or strong drink. That's a reference to the vow of a Nazarite from the book of Numbers. A Nazarite was someone who temporarily set himself apart from society. And the sign that he was set apart was he drank no wine. It, Palestine was the Napa Valley of the Middle East. So in that region, this was your common drink. Their major exports were olive oil and wine. So the, for a man living in that region to not drink wine meant he was not part of society. He was setting himself apart for a while. And uh, why would he do this? Well, he set himself apart from society to be with God. So they would, they would go out into the wilderness, live outside the city, out in the wilderness for a while during this temporary period, kind of like a retreat out into the desert. And they would live out there a very simple life, away from the family, away from the city, away from the hustle and bustle, away from all the the comforts of of the city, and live out there on simple food and water and pray. And John the Baptist, we see, does this. He becomes, in a certain sense, a perpetual Nazarite, almost like Samson in the Old Testament. But here we have a, a little bit more of a righteous one. So John the Baptist is going to go out in the wilderness, live away from the society that is not drinking wine or strong drink. He'll be out away in the wilderness preparing for his coming ministry. And the next time we'll see him 
is when he's about 30 years old, out there, as you mentioned, baptizing right there at the Jordan River, and then he encounters Jesus. What a powerful image this is for us today in the light, kind of that shining light of Pentecost in which we're still living. Um, you know, I think of the apostles as after the day of Pentecost, um, how they began their ministry, but, but it, in some sense, there was this time period of packing their bags, getting ready to go out beyond Jerusalem, to go out into the world um, to announce the good news, to do exactly what John the Baptist had done, which is point the way to a deeper relationship with God, to announce the resurrection, to point the way to Christ. Um, and during this time period between Pentecost and the Feast of Saints Peter and Paul, the church prescribes this fast per period for us in a similar manner for us to uh, internalize, accept, and make real in our life the gift we received on the Feast of Pentecost the, and on the, on the great day of our baptism in, in which we were thrust into, made one with the life of God himself. So that we could say with St. Paul, is no longer I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me. And during this time of retreat, uh, if you will, this time of the, of the Apostles' Fast, we should be doing exactly what John the Baptist did here, and that is retreat from society for a while, that when the day of our ministry, our calling comes, uh, we are ready to do to exactly what John did, which is to point the way to the Lamb of God. Let us conclude today with the Traparian of, of uh, the Nativity of, of John, the Traparian of the Forerunner, um, it says so beautifully, the prophet and forerunner of the coming of Christ, in spite of our eagerness to render you due honor, we fall short when singing your praise. Your glorious birth saved your mother from the shame of barrenness, returned to your father the power of speech, and heralded the worldwide preaching of the incarnation of the Son of God. You know, Father, and, and, and all of our participants today, I encourage you to make this beautiful Traparian your prayer, um, that you also will be filled up with the gift of the Holy Spirit, and that you may participate in the ministry of John the Baptist, uh, the, the heralding, the worldwide heralding and preaching of the incarnation of the Son of God. And, and we're really, we are challenged Am I, or how am I, during this time of the Apostles' Fast, living my life as John did, preparing myself for the ministry which, which Christ has called me to? You know, like each one of us, John uh, uh, was formed in his mother's womb, in the womb of Elizabeth. Each one of us, like John, um, has been chosen by God from our mother's womb. Each one of us have been baptized uh, by the will of God. Uh, we are made and chosen for a ministry to prepare for the coming of the Messiah, the incarnation of God in the lives of those around us. Um, are we living up to that calling? And are we willing to be the one to stand before our brothers and sisters, our co-workers, and point the way to the Lamb of God? To Christ our God be glory both now and ever and unto ages of ages. Amen. Amen.